Hi there. Today we speak about imagery taken from high altitude platforms and how this information data can be used to generate useful insights for businesses on Earth. And we do this with Dr. Ignacy Luke from uh, Near Space Labs, that is a startup company operating between Europe and the United States. Hi, Ignacy. Thank you for joining us today. Hello, Alessandro. Thank you for having me here today in your series. So about myself, I started my career as a space engineer in DMD space and in the European Space Agency in the Netherlands. I was working in satellite navigation in the Galileo program. I also give training courses uh, in one of the pioneering centers in Spain for drone-based remote sensing, which is the Barcelona Drone Center in Moya. I also joined, as you know, Skoltec for a PhD in 2013 and Space Systems Engineering, if the audience is curious and interested in that, please contact Alessandro, maybe you can follow my footsteps. After my PhD, I co-founded and uh, I'm the CTO of New York State Labs. Tell us a bit about the company and what was the motivation to start it? So we started the company in 2017 with my co-founder, Fitzny Matevosian. At the time it was called Swiftera, now we transitioned the brand into Near Space Labs. So basically the idea came from two different things we were doing at the time. On one hand, we were working a lot with stratospheric balloons, and I think you have more of this uh, in other videos of this series. High altitude balloons or stratospheric balloons are very useful to test a lot of technologies, not only the small types uh, like the latex ones, but also NASA uses weather balloons as solid weather. The big, big stratospheric balloons for uh, technology testing, for astronomy, for astrophysics. So this is something that we use in the space segment from time to time, but not so much. Or it wasn't used to look at the air, right, for Earth observation. And at the same time, we were working in this grant for the European Commission to see the future evolution of the European segment in Europe about Earth observation satellites. So those satellites that use all sorts of sensors like radars, uh, imaging sensors, multispectral sensors to look into geophysics, climate, plane imaging, basically the state of the planet. There were the issues that we are assessing and seeing and they were paying us to see in these systems about the revisit that you can get. And that's how we combine these two things to actually get the idea of the company that we could use these balloons not only as technology testing means but also to look at the earth and cover some of the gaps that the satellite market has. What are the specific gaps in satellite imagery and how are you addressing those? Yeah, so basically if you want to think about the gaps, uh, you're going to think about to me the three key performances that earth observation systems have. The first oh, of these ones obviously is the resolution. And it doesn't matter what type of sensor you have, eventually you're dealing with some kind of spatial resolution, which is how many pixels per unit uh, physical dimension you can have. So if you have one pixel per meter, if you have one pixel per centimeter, so how green, how fine can you see things on the ground with your sensor? That's fundamental, of course. And then another second thing, which is very important, is the coverage. Basically, how many square kilometers or... Uh, What's the instantaneous field of view of your sensor? And at the end of the day, how much of the air do you have captured? And the third key element is here is the revisit, which is how often can you capture the very same target, the very same location on Earth? So does it take you a week? Does it take you hours, days? Can you just uh, see the same thing unless you wait for months? This is a very important aspect also of Earth observation. These three things configure in general uh, how would your Earth observation product is going to be or what is going to be the uses and applications of this service. And the technology plays a big role of uh, what can you do, what you can do in terms of this metric. So if you have a look at the different systems that we have for Earth observation nowadays and we classify them by altitude, we can start with satellites at geostationary height, that is 42,000 kilometers from the center of the Earth. At this height, which is used for Earth observation, for instance, the Metosat satellites for the weather, it's pretty good the coverage you can get. You see almost a third of the Earth. You see everything instantaneously because of the uh, non-relative motion between the Earth and your satellite. But the resolution you get is really low. It's hundreds of meters typically. Why? Because you're really far away. And unless you mount really, really, really big, and I'm, I'm talking gigantic instruments on the satellites, you're not going to have a great resolution, right? 
Great resolution nowadays is more like 30 centimeters per pixel. That's the best that commercial satellites can do right now. And that's another question for the space segment. Will we able, uh, ever be able to mount really big um, optics on the geostationary satellites? I don't know, maybe some other stuff for your series, Alessandro. Another orbit we can use for this observation commonly is low Earth orbit. And people have been doing, using this uh, for ages now. It's very close, you're 400 to 800 kilometers from the ground. You can get better resolution, those are the 30 centimeters I was talking about. But if you want good revisit because of the way orbits work and the way um, your satellite is always uh, moving over the Earth to new locations, you have to employ a lot of satellites. And that was actually a part of my career. I was doing constellation assessments and constellation design. And you need a lot of satellites if you want to have good revisits and good coverage of a planet. And these 30 centimeter resolution satellites are very expensive. One solution you can do is basically use a lot of satellites. Uh, some companies notoriously have gone that way with CubeSats, which is a very comparatively cheap way uh, to deploy a lot of satellites and solve the revisit and coverage problem. But then the resolution you get with a CubeSat is not yet 30 centimeters per pixel. Only the big birds can do that. So you remain with this problem of having very high resolution and very updated frequency for your imaging. And one way people have gone about it, and it's not only as at near space labs, but also it's been theorizing for a long time, the idea of high altitude pseudo satellites, HAPS, some people call it, which is nonetheless use the stratosphere to do your imaging. And what's the stratosphere? It's this layer in between 12 kilometers, depending on when you are in the planet, to about 30 uh, kilometers, twice the height of airliners, which is not space, but uh, some people prefer it to near space, so here we are with our company name. And basically in the stratosphere, because of the wind speeds being very low, you can have your vehicle not drift along and have a quite large field of view because you're really at a good vantage point, but still you're much closer to the ground than other systems like satellites that we're talking about so you're really able to deliver a much better resolution what are you trading uh, for all this coverage obviously right because your stratospheric vehicle is not going to be able to see a whole continent just a small area like a city and that's why we are focused on urban imaging mostly then there are other systems that you can also be using which is um, conventional planes and drones and this is not uncommon and planes have been used for a long time they have cost issues drones are great drones are here to solve the uh, many remote sensing problems the industry has but you can only cover so much with a drone in a day at the altitudes they work you, ha you need many many passes if you're wanting to cover something like a city not to speak about the problems that you're gonna regulation problems that you're gonna be having if you want to use a drone we hear about Loom and other projects that are indeed intending to fly platforms into the stratosphere. What's so special about it and what can we fly there? So what's special about the stratosphere, as we said, is that the, the winds are not that intense. Temperatures though are very complicated. There's, you're around minus 50, you're going to be needing to have some kind of environmental control system. But you have a really good trade between coverage, resolution and the revisit element. Uh, there's other people trying to do this. There's many technologies you can try to deploy in the stratosphere. First, obviously, planes. There's a very big manufacturer doing stratospheric planes right now. Planes are a great solution um, to do remote sensing from the stratosphere, but because of the low density of the stratosphere, you're going to need really, really very good lift-to-drag ratio. So we're talking about planes with really, really thin and long winds, like gliders, like sports gliders people use. And these planes have to be extremely that way to be able to lift themselves at 20 something, 30 kilometers. So these general structural problems, they also have to have, if they want endurance, solar cells, and they are a limit at the limit of their capacity nowadays. And they are not able to harvest enough energy at very high latitudes nowadays. So it's a, it's a really interesting solution. It's at the edge of what's possible nowadays. And we're going to see more of those. But the cost element of those is not going to be groundbreaking when you compare it to satellites, for instance. Another thing you can do is blimps or dirigibles. And there's another big manufacturer working on them. Dirigibles are much better than planes in terms of payload capacity. They scale up very well with size. The bigger they are proportional, the better they are in their payload capability. That's not something you see normally in aerospace, something that uh, scales properly with size, maybe, maybe launchers. 
So um, blimps are difficult for all other sorts of things, basically all based in like being able to retain the gas in their envelope and also the sheer size of the, of the operation. We're talking about hundreds of meters blimps to be able to lift into the stratosphere. And then there's a third technology, the technology we use, which is balloons. And as I was talking before, um, there's been balloons used for uh, space testing and for technology testing for decades and probably centuries now. But uh, what's special about the balloons we use is that we just use plain meteorological uh, weather balloon zones, but with a very, very lightweight payload on them. So what is the payload that you use in your balloon? How does it work? Yeah, so as far as the payload goes, we have an industrial camera system that is uh, able to image from the stratosphere at 30 centimeters per pixel. And we have a three degrees of freedom stabilized system that is able to point this camera and image around 400 kilometers. And uh, we normally operate this at 20 kilometers. So the con of this is we release the balloon. We have a very good trajectory prediction. We know where the winds are going to take us. So we just release it from the right place. We stabilize the vehicle at around 20 kilometers. We have an altitude control system, and then we slowly drift over the target, which in our case is mostly urban areas where we do our imaging. And when the time is right, we release the system. It has uh, both ways, uplink, downlink, telemetry. And it lands in a chip, and we retrieve the images. And then comes the second important part of the company, or the other part of the tech stack, which is all of our software and how we process all this imaging, how we stitch all these images, we correct for the colors, we correct for atmospheric distortions, for geometric distortions, and we basically georeference and we search geotiffs that people are able to use in their GIS systems or just um, directly on screen or do any machine learning on them, right? And this is through API, so I encourage the audience to drop us a line. We have a free sample of Austin last year, so you can already check for yourself see how it looks. So our concept of operation is pretty simply not so different from what amateurs do uh, with ballooning. We basically release our balloon, we have a very good grasp on the wind trajectory, we know where it's going to go, so it goes over the area of interest. We have a cruising uh, an altitude control technology, we are able to keep uh, the balloon at the same altitude when we want, so we hit the right patch of winds and we totally control where it's going. You can see there's a uh, there's few, few papers from universities, from Stanford, from MIT about altitude control with latex balloons. That's something you can look at. It's it's really interesting, just uh, as a technology to develop for for a team of students interested in ballooning. And basically, then we have a very very lightweight platform. And amateurs will also understand the advantages, the regulatory advantages of having a very lightweight platform. And we've put a lot of work and hours into that. And in a sense, we're the CubeSat of the stratosphere because we have a vehicle that is less than 12 pounds and it does 30 centimeters imaging with that. We are able to scan a pretty large area, basically a whole city in our three to four hours operation. And then we basically uh, detach the balloon, it lands, we retrieve the imaging. Do you see yourself as a new space company? Yeah, to me, new space is this introduction of the lean startup ideas that have been in Silicon Valley for, for more than a decade now into the aerospace world. And in our case, I think it's played a big role because we have this very lightweight system of 3D printed all carbon fiber parts and we try to develop it as fast as we could and not go for a very large system but something that we could develop quickly with a small team to already validate our business assumptions and i think this is all over the aerospace industry now and we see a lot of people doing software doing launchers doing constellations trying to get that approach into space in space we've been doing projects of 10 plus years hundreds of millions very capable systems that, you know, they couldn't fail because of how much investment they have been put into them. And this was a vicious circle. And it has been broken with this tolerance to failure. Like now in new space, the idea for me is that, you know, if your vehicle fails, if your launcher fails, if your mission gets lost from time to time is okay, you're just going to learn something and move fast. And if your vehicles are cheap enough and if what you're doing has a good unit economics, 
you're actually able to allow for some failures from time to time and do things much faster than uh, traditional aerospace. And I think it's here to stay, and I hope we see more and more of that. Thank you so much, Ignasi, for joining me today for this conversation. It has been very interesting and very insightful. I sincerely wish you and the team at Near Space Labs the best and best of successes. Bye. Ciao.